Cracking the Code of Christian Culture, Your Essential Guide. What is the Christian culture? I want to take a moment of your time and introduce you to this church. I want you to understand how we think and how we operate. I want you to understand that we are and have been and will always be a church. We are not a social club. We are not an entertainment center and we are not a coffee shop. We represent the kingdom of God here on the earth. We hold to traditional values. We use traditional words according to the word of God to describe who we are, what we believe, and who we represent. I want to show you some things that have long been forgotten in many churches, but not here at New Harvest Revival Center. We have not forgotten the culture that we came out of, and we will not betray the culture that we represent. So let me ask you, what is a culture? More specifically, what is our culture? Our culture is not the culture of the country that we live in. Ours is the culture of Christianity. It is not the culture of California or the United States, and it is not the culture of Chile, Mexico, Venezuela, or Colombia. It is the culture of Christianity, the culture of the church. The church is who we are, not something that we do or some place that we go to. Our culture is different from the world's cultures. Our culture was the pattern for the world's cultures. Our leader is the originator, not the imitator. Our culture was created to rule and reign over the world that we live in. Our culture was intended to change the world that we live in. Every culture has these things in common. Every culture has a king or a leader. Every king has a name. Every king has a kingdom. Every kingdom has a name. Every kingdom has authority. Every kingdom has dominion. Every kingdom has a territory of influence. Every kingdom has a flag. Every kingdom has laws. Every kingdom has principles. Every kingdom has education. Every kingdom has a government. Every kingdom has a people. Every people have their traditions. Every culture has a language. Every culture has its music. Every culture has art. Every culture has literature. Every culture has its customs. Every culture has its ethics and values. And every culture has its institutions. Today we have presidents instead of kings, but they are essentially the same. The political structures are similar, but the cultures are very different. Every king has a name. Our king's name is Jesus. Every king has a kingdom. We can choose to live in his kingdom. Every kingdom has a name. Its name is the kingdom of God. Every kingdom has authority. That authority has been delegated to us. Every kingdom has dominion. 
our kingdom's reign is over all the earth. Every kingdom has a territory of influence. It is over all of creation. And every kingdom has a flag. We have a banner spiritual and a banner physical. Jehovah Nisi. Every kingdom has laws. Our laws are the laws of the kingdom. Every kingdom, every kingdom has principles. Our principles are in the Bible. Every kingdom has education. The word of God is our truth and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Every kingdom has a government, an order, and structure. This is what we call the church. Every kingdom has people. We are called Christians. Every people has a culture. It's called Christianity. Every culture has a language, the language of the Bible. The words we use when we talk to one another about the Lord. Every culture has its music. The church has its own music and we sing about our king. Every culture has art. Every culture has literature. Our literature is called the Holy Bible. Every culture has its customs. We meet on certain days and we celebrate certain events of our history and we have the sacraments of the church. Every culture has its ethics, morals, and values. Ours come from the values of our king. Every culture has its institutions. It's called the church, the family, and marriage. There are four kingdoms that we deal with. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of man, the kingdom of of Satan. These kingdoms share similar structures and cultures, but have a very different purpose, direction, goals, and intentions. The kingdom of heaven, found in heaven, and the king is the Lord Jesus Christ, and is administered by the Lord and his angels. The kingdom of God, found on the earth, but the king is the Lord Jesus Christ and is administered by his church, his people, and the principles and laws of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of man, found on the earth, but the king is unregenerate fallen man and is administered by man's laws and self-interest. The kingdom of Satan confined to the realm of the earth and is administered by fallen and condemned creatures once called angels but now known as demons. Understanding kingdom of God culture. You are in a spiritual war. Scripture confirms that you have spiritual authority to cast out devils, bind and loose, and use the name of Jesus. Scripture declares in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are strongly fortified defensive structures. These structures are fortified belief systems known as kingdoms. Christians are in a war for dominion, kingdom against kingdom, 
culture against culture, values against values, truth against lies, and light against darkness. Paul spoke of the war saying, it's not against flesh and blood, but spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. These heavenly places are commanding heights. In other words, they are the dwelling places where demonically influenced rulers reside, govern, and oversee their agendas. Sometimes we forget that evil spirits teach. They have wiles, seductions, philosophies, beliefs, values, and world views. They pass these on to men and women that pass them on to others. When men gather around these demonically inspired teachings, they develop a kingdom. Kingdoms are recognized by culture. Cultures can conflict. The kingdom of darkness, for example, will conflict with the kingdom of light. So let's talk about Christ's kingdom culture. Every kingdom has cultural elements that include language, economic system, religion, social organization, customs and traditions, government and arts, literature, music, and fashion. The kingdom of God has the same basic cultural elements such as there's language. Christians can be identified around the world by their language. We recognize other Christians because they believe, speak, and take action based on the Word of God. The people of other cultures do not readily understand some of the words that we use. For example, we might say, Are you saved? We understand what that means, but they won't. We might say that, the fire of God fell in the church last night, and they might think that the building burned to the ground. We might say that God loves you just as you are, but they might think that that means God approves of their lifestyles, which may be very contrary to his word. We live in families, but they might say that they live in tribes. Their word for marriage might mean something very different from our meaning. We might say that the pastor was drunk in the spirit, but there was no alcohol or drugs consumed. When we say Lord, we are referring to Jesus Christ. Some cultures use the word Lord to refer to Satan. There is an economic system. Christians engage in the economic system of the kingdom of God by acting on kingdom economic principles like the lifestyle of faith in God, giving and receiving, sowing and reaping, working hard, multiplying, producing, increasing, subduing, and taking dominion. Someone outside of our culture might think that we are buying our way into heaven or church membership. There is religion. The religion in the kingdom of God is Christianity. A Christian looks only unto Christ, not the state, as protector, provider, king, lord, and savior. Some cultures worship creation with mankind or nature as the center of their altar, as their religion. We have social organizations. 
Social groups consist of such things as local Christian churches, Christian schools, orphanages, medical clinics, and missions organizations. Other cultures might have bars and discotheques. There are customs and traditions that include baby dedications, Christian covenant marriages between a man and a woman, water baptism, communion, and Christian holidays like Resurrection Sunday and Christmas. There is government. The church, family, disciples, and kingdom of God are governed by the Word of God, biblical law, ordinances, sanctions, and the authority of local church leadership and fathers as head of household. Some cultures are governed by their feelings. We have art, literature, and music. And within the art and literature, Christians have the Bible, Christian books, and music. So what are kingdom values? Scripture says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33. Now, every kingdom, including the kingdom of God, has a culture. Not only do kingdoms have a culture, they have values. Values represent the very fabric of culture, and society. Throughout the world, we see a rapid decay of morals and an escalation of corruption and violence. This escalation of social chaos has much to do with the promotion of demonic kingdom values. As Christians, we have instructions for partaking in the divine nature of God and escaping corruption within a society as we put first kingdom culture and values. 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to, 3 to 8 tells us, According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 8. To escape the degeneration of society, Scripture teaches you to embrace biblical values. Values are at the core of your soul. They define your understanding of right and wrong, good and bad, and determine how you see the world. Now notice that Peter uses words that describe Christian values, such as faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. The spiritual warfare against principalities and powers can be seen in the warfare against these Christian values. 
you are not just waging war against some unseen spirit, but the teachings of these spirits that are promoted by people. In other words, spirits use people to advance their culture, principles, worldviews, and values. These are the strongholds we are waging warfare against. When someone attacks you as a Christian, what are they attacking? Is it your gender, skin color, social status, financial condition, family name, job type, education, faith, or religion? Or is it your Christian values? When you find yourself in conflict, what's the conflict about? I submit that it has much to do with the Christian values that you stand for. Values can be shared with others and draw people groups together. Christian values are under attack. Cultural Marxism, for example, has attacked Christian values with political correctness. When Christian values conflict with worldly values, you often hear accusations like, you're homophobic, you're intolerant, you're judgmental. Marxists are masters at killing the messenger while ignoring the truth of the message. Biblical values are under attack by God-haters. These God-haters have hijacked many kingdoms in our nation, including media, Hollywood, and schools. They promote their values in public universities, schools, government organizations, media, and news outlets. These are the sons of Cain that did not want to submit to God, but built in rebellion the first secular humanistic society or kingdom, according to Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. These reprobates are found in some writers, editors, producers, media people, bureaucrats, academics, entertain, entertainers, lobbyists, lawyers, policymakers, planners, artists, analysts, consultants, and even pastors of certain churches. They are the modern version of scribes and Pharisees. Now, together we can win the battle of kingdoms. Our nation, our children, our families do not belong to state or Satan. Let's have the same spirit as Caleb who said, They are bread for us. Let us go up at once for we are well able. These kingdoms are in conflict for dominion, and the war is for control. The enemies of Christ are opposing the dominion of God through you. You are not alone. Nevertheless, Christ has a faithful remnant serving him in their generation. This remnant understands the words kingdom, dominion, rule, reign, and restoration. Here's an example using the words kingdom, rule, and restoration. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Then said Samuel to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew or restore the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord. Now here the prophet gives instruction to God's kingdom of priests to restore the Lord's reign in Gilgal. In the original language, renew 
means to repair and to restore. The word kingdom suggests a territory or kingdom governed by a king. Now notice in this text, the scope of the Lord's influence seems to be confined to a people group within a specific territory. This doesn't mean that God is not sovereign of the world, but simply describes a particular group of people, a royal priesthood of kings, a holy nation, and a territory, Gilgal, under the influence of the Lord through his royal priesthood. Samuel also uses the word renew as a specific ministry directive. Now, this is interesting because it implies that this territory was once under the rule of the Lord, but somehow became ruled by another. Now, understanding the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof brings substance to the, to the restoration and renewal of the kingdom of God in Gilgal. It also confirms that God created the heavens and the earth, giving dominion to Adam, who later committed high treason, thus surrendering his kingship to the serpent. To restore territory under the leadership of Christ requires of people like you that are submitted to the authority of Christ that carries their king's values, beliefs, laws, and culture into the territory. Christ said it like this, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This means placing yourself under the authority of Christ while following his instructions for living. So let's talk about the world that we live in. We live in a world of conflicting kingdoms and cultures. It is up to us as individuals to decide which kingdom laws and reign will have authority over us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, we are told to submit to the laws of the land. But in Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, we see that we are to submit to the higher laws of the of the Lord if the laws of man conflict with the laws of the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Every king has a name. Our king's name is Jesus. Every king has a kingdom. We can choose to live in his kingdom. Every kingdom has a name. Its name is the kingdom of God. Speak to those storms mountains, and giants that get in your way. Choose this day which kingdom will reign in your life. So what does all this mean? It means that you have to decide daily to follow after Jesus and to live in his kingdom under his ways and under his protection and provisions. It also means that you can change your residence or change your kingdom address right here, right now. And it means that you can place your life, your finances, your marriage, your jobs, your families under the Lordship of Jesus and claim protection under his higher laws, just like 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. When you do this, everything in your life, everything in this life, the kingdom of man or the kingdom of Satan, must submit and bow its knees to the higher laws of the kingdom of God. Yes, the war for dominion is on. Nevertheless, you win. So how does the Lord see you? You are an ambassador of the kingdom of God. The other kingdoms conflict with the kingdom of God for dominion. The type of conflict may change depending upon the city, nation, or season that you reside in. I want you to start to see yourself as an ambassador for Christ, an official representative of the kingdom of God, and as such, you are well able to deal with kingdom conflict. You have the full backing and support of the kingdom behind you and full authority to enforce the laws and principles of the kingdom of God here on the earth. Embracing your ministry as an ambassador representative will help you understand Christian culture, values, and the spiritual warfare you are involved from a different perspective. Historically, an ambassador is an official representative of a kingdom sent by a king to convey his wishes, laws, values, culture, and expectations. Without the ministry of a kingdom, ambassador, it was impossible for the people to understand how to transition their lives and society to match that of their king. This is what we are all called to do and called to be, to be an ambassador of our king. The world that we live in, we live in a world of conflicting kingdoms and cultures. It is up to us as individuals to decide which kingdom's laws and reign will have authority over us. In 1 Peter 2.13, we are told to submit to the laws of the land, but in Daniel 3.13-18, we see that we are to submit to the higher laws of the Lord if the laws of man conflict with the laws of the kingdom of God. Now, 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the image which I have made, that's great. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast that very same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning 
fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image that you have set up. The ambassador's lifestyle. Spiritual warfare is part of the victorious Christian lifestyle. After the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he rebuked evil spirits, faced down Satan, healed the sick, raised the dead, rebuked storms, and spoiled principalities and powers. Spiritual warfare is part of Christianity, and the spiritual warfare is not over. Historically, the rise and fall of spiritual power within the Church of Jesus has been re related to the acknowledgement and opposition towards demonic principalities and powers. As leaders recognized the spiritual warfare caused by demon powers, they equipped believers to use their delegated spiritual authority to fight back. When leaders ignored the dark rulers of this world, believers and the church suffered. You are in a spiritual war, whether you want to be or not. Jesus did not ignore demon powers, and he did not teach his disciples and apostles to ignore them either, according to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. The apostle Paul taught the church in Ephesus how to, how to battle, how to fight. He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be well able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wicked, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand and fight back in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13. Warriors wear armor. Armor is for the fighting man. Paul likens spiritual opposition to warfare. He teaches five important truths. Christ's followers should be strong in the Lord. They should be full of spiritual power. Evil spirits have methods and strategies. The battle is spiritual, not natural. Spiritual warriors wear the armor of God, a battle-ready lifestyle. The Apostle Paul knew much about spiritual opposition against him. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. He continually uses warfare terms when teaching and training leaders. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. Therefore, you endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. And stay free. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. War, a good warfare. This charge I commit unto thee, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that you by them might war a good warfare. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, chapter 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. Spiritual weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. So let's take a look and let's talk about how to live in the midst of conflict. You are a warrior. You are an ambassador. You speak to those storms, mountains, and giants that get in your way. Occupy until Jesus comes. This means to stay busy doing the business of the king. Choose this day which kingdom will reign in your life. This has been a very hard, but a timely teaching. I pray that you will let it sink into your spirit and take it to heart. And I want to thank you for your time. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you, protect you, guide you as you follow hard after him. God bless you.